So thank you for that introduction and good morning. Um, as the title of my talk suggests, I am going to be dividing my time between two different topics today. I'll start by discussing spotted lanternfly, which is a new invasive that we've been on high alert for the past couple years. And then for the second half of my time, I'm going to spend some, I'm going to be discussing some of the work we've been doing with spotted wing drosophila, looking at its interactions with fruit rot fungi. Um, so spotted lanternfly is an invasive plant hopper that's native to China. It was first detected in the United States in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. And since that time, there's been a lot of concern over this insect because it does have the potential to be a major pest in a number of different fruit crops. Um, luckily, these flies are fairly easy to spot and identify in their adult life stage. Um, the adults are about one inch long and they have two sets of wings. Um, I have a couple of specimens here that I'll pass around, so if you want to take a look at them, um, I just ask that you return them to me at the end of my talk. Um, as you look at this specimen, you'll see that the first pair of wings, or the outer wings when they're at rest, are kind of a grayish brown with these dark black spots. And then the second pair of wings, or their hind wings, have this bright red sp um, spot to them as well, which is only visible when they're flying. Spotted and lanternfly also goes through four nymphal instars, the first three instars, um, their bodies are completely black with a couple of white spots, um, so they can be somewhat difficult to spot. But you can see that by the time they get to this fourth instar, they do start to develop some red coloration on their body. Um, female spotted lanternflies will lay their eggs in clutches of about 30 to 50 eggs. Immediately after they lay the eggs, um, they will cover them with this gray waxy coating, um, which serves as a bit of a protective layer. Over time, that coating will dry, and as it dries, it changes to a muddy brown color. Um, once the coating is brown, it can be somewhat difficult to spot the egg masses. It looks, really, looks like a splash of mud on the side of the tree, so if you're not looking carefully, it's easy to miss it. In terms of their life cycle, spot and lanternfly goes through one generation every year. It's thought to overwinter in the egg stages, with the nymphs hatching sometime in early May. Then from May to July, they go through their four nymphal instars, feeding on a variety of host plants before eventually emerging as adults in the late summer and early fall. The adult life stage is considered to be a fairly weak flyer. Though they do have a set of wings and are capable of flight, it's actually thought that these insects prefer to hop from one host plant to another and will instead use their wings to help them glide. Um, despite this, they do disperse fairly widely when they're laying the eggs. And typically, egg laying will begin sometime in the fall, typically around October. Um, and this will continue through November or December. One of the challenges with spot and lanternfly is that this insect has a very broad host range. Um, the tree of heaven, a native, an invasive tree that's native to China, it appears to be one of their preferred hosts. And there has been research that suggests that in the fall, the adult spotted lanternflies will concentrate their feeding and reproductive efforts on this particular tree. But this isn't an exclusive relationship. In addition to the tree of heaven, we see that these insects will lay their eggs and colonize on a number of other species of trees, including several um, economically important crops, such as hardwood fruits like apples or peaches, as well as blueberries and grapes. If you look at this picture in the lower right-hand corner, um, the lighting's a little difficult, but you can see that these, all these masses, which are actually the adult flies. And so one of the challenges with spotted lanternfly is that these insects have this aggregation behavior. So they'll cluster in large numbers on a given host plant when they're feeding, which can really exacerbate feeding damage. Um, some of the signs of spotted lanternfly infestation include um, large amounts of honeydew, this honeydew is a sugary liquid that the lanternflies produce as a byproduct of their digestion. Um, and they will squirt it out and it'll land on a, all the surrounding foliage and fruit on the trees. In addition to creating a big stucky mess, um, the honeydew will also attract a number of other insects that could be pests, such as honeybees or hornets or ants. Just to give you a sense of how much um, honeydew that these insects are capable of producing, this video was taken by Erica Smyers, a PhD student at Penn State University. And if you watch closely, you'll see little flashes um, of water, what looks like water, coming through the screen, um, particularly in this upper left-hand corner. Um, so it almost looked like a raindrop. Um, and you also can see some here in the center as well. Yep, there it is. 
Um, and so that is actually the honeydew that is being excreted by the lanternflies. Um, and then there it is again in the center. So um, in addition to the honeydew, spot or lanternfly feeding can also damage the trees. These insects have piercing sucking mouth parts, which means when they're feeding on a tree, they'll actually penetrate through the bark to reach the tree's phloem and feed on the sap. Um, when they're feeding on the sap, particularly when they feed in large numbers, this can create wounds that then ooze sap and result in these dark streaks along the side of the tree, as you can see in these left hand um, most pictures. In addition, both the sap as well as the honeydew that I previously showed you can also contribute to the growth of sooty mold around the base of the tree. Um, while this isn't harmful to humans, heavy uh, loads of sooty mold can be damaging to plant health. Um, so currently, spot and lanterns fly distribution in the mid-Atlantic region is spreading slowly. Um, this map is up to date as of December 2018 and shows this insect's distribution at the county level. The counties that are highlighted in blue represent areas where spot and lanternfly has been detected and is known to have established a breeding population. So in other words, this is where we currently have active infestations. You can see that the majority of infestations are clustered around Berks County, Pennsylvania, which, were, which is not surprising since this is where the pest was initially detected. But we do have one other active breeding population up here in Frederick County, Virginia. Um, and it's actually thought that um, this Virginia population is related to the initial Pennsylvania invasion. Um, it's the same batch of eggs that came in. Apart from that, the counties that are highlighted in yellow represent areas where spotter and lanternfly has been detected, either in a trap or for visual sighting. But as far as we know, um, it hasn't yet actively established in those counties. So we can see that in addition to spreading out through parts of Pennsylvania, as well as Delaware, we do have one sighting here in Maryland, up in Cecil County. Um, however, this was one male that they caught in a trap last winter, which means they probably haven't yet started laying eggs in Maryland, and we don't have spotter and lanternfly as a problem yet. But looking at the distribution, you can see that Maryland is surrounded by a lot of active hotspots, which means that it's important that we be vigilant for this pest um, and take as many steps as possible to prevent it from coming into our state. And so one of the most important things that we can do at this point is just be vigilant for spotter and lanternfly and if there are any sightings, we want to report them to the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, in terms of what to look for, um, egg masses can be sometimes tricky to find, but depending on how fresh they are, you may be able to spot them. Um, typically, these egg masses are laid on any smooth surface. So this can include the bark of trees, um, as well as grapevines, and even non-crop objects like fence posts. Um, they've also been found on rocks, the sides of houses, underneath car bumpers, um, so they really can be anywhere. In general, the adult life stage is going to be a little bit easier to see um, since these are slightly bigger. And you can usually find the adults on the base of the trees that they're feeding on. Um, and so in particular, Tree of Heaven, which is a preferred host species, is probably a pretty good bet for finding it. Um, during the daytime, these insects tend to cluster around the base of the plant, which makes it easier to spot them. But at dusk and at night, um, they do tend to be pretty active and crawl around. If you would like more information about the spotted lanternfly, um, I recommend checking out some of the resources that have been published up in Pennsylvania, particularly by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture or Penn State University. Um, in the past couple of years, they have been doing a lot of really good work looking into both the biology and the management of spotted lanternfly. And at this point, a lot of the information that we know about this insect is really coming from them. Um, and finally, to summarize and um, highlight, the most important thing that we can do at this point for spotter and lanternfly is be vigilant for it and report any findings as soon as possible to the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, if you do come across an egg mass or an adult, if possible, try to collect it so we can positively confirm the identification. But at the very least, um, give the MBA a call. There's a phone number, or you can email them through this email address, don'tbug.md at maryland.gov. Um, and if we do spot it, the MDA is going to be the organization that's sending folks out to take a look and determine the appropriate course of action. Um, so at this point, that's all I have for you on spotter and lanternfly. Um, I thought I would take a pause and see if there's any questions about this before I move on to the next topic. Is there any uh, recommend, it seems like grapes are the most susceptible. Mm -hmm. Are there any of the sprays that they've had to do in Pennsylvania that we should be thinking about in our grape spray programs? 
Um, so that's a great point. Um, there are a number of insecticides that will kill the spotter and lanternfly. I don't know the list off the top of my head, but it includes a lot of different products. Like I think spinosad was on there, malathion. Um, and again, you can find more comprehensive information about those insecticides at Penn State University or the PEDA. Um, in terms of incorporating into your spray programs at this point, um, we probably don't need to right now since we don't have active infestations. Um, and I also don't know what the registration status of these insecticides are for spotter and lanternfly. Um, but if it does move into Maryland, um, pesticides and insecticides will be an option. Yeah? Maggie, I have that lanternfly probably a half hour from here. Oh, really? And it killed an oak tree. Okay. I watched it actually do exactly what you had on the, on the front mm -hmm. where it peeled the bark back. Yeah. I didn't know it was the lanternfly until I cut the tree down and they came out of the bark. The adults? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, kill, I killed, I know, five of them. But hmm. how many were there? I was working, you know how that goes. Yeah. And, but it was definitely the lanternfly. Okay. Were you able to collect any specimens? No. I just okay. put them on my glove. Um. <laughs> Where was he okay? He said about how? Originally. It killed the tree in six months. Wow. Wow. Is it really? Um, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, so we may want to report that, I guess, to the MDA. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it, it is possible. Um, they may have been sighted about half an hour from here. And one of the challenges with spotter and lanternfly is that because their egg masses are so difficult to spot, it's really easy to accidentally spread them. Um, I mentioned that they can get on the bumpers of cars, so if you're driving from a quarantine area into an uninfested area, that's one possible route of introduction. Um, the Pennsylvania population was introduced through a shipment of rocks. Um, so I think it definitely is possible, um, and hopefully we'll be able to detect it and catch it in time before it becomes a real problem. Okay, any other questions? All right, great. Um, and if you think of anything else in the meantime, I'm happy to come back to this topic um, at the end of my talk or during one of the breaks. Okay, so moving on to the second half of my talk, um, I'm gonna be going over some of the work our lab has been doing, looking at interactions between spotted wing drosophila and fruit rot fungi. And so to give you a brief overview, I'll start by providing some background information on spotted wing drosophila and the fungal pathogens that I'm working with. And then for the latter half, I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing to both survey like potential fungal associations and also laboratory experiments where we've been trying to determine if they are potentially acting as a vector for these diseases. So spotted wing drosophila, or SWD, is an invasive fruit fly that is native to southeastern Asia. It was first detected in the United States and California in 2008 and since that time has become one of the most important pests in small fruit crops throughout the country. Um, in particular, here in Maryland, we tend to see the heaviest spotted wing problems in fall fruiting crops, um, such as raspberries or blackberries. And the reason spotted wing drosophila is such a pest is that these female flies have a serrated ovipositor, which is heavily sclerotized. And this allows them to cut through the intact skin of ripening fruit when they lay their eggs. So the larvae are developing in what would otherwise be considered marketable produce. In terms of the damage that spotted wing drosophila can cause, um, it is possible that female oviposition into fruit can leave small scars, particularly in firmer fruit varieties like cherries and blueberries. Um, sometimes when you squeeze these fruits, a small drop of juice will exude from the oviposition wound. Um, however, um, the main concern with spotted wing drosophila comes from the larval stage. As the larvae develop inside of fruit and grow into the later instars, we tend to see the formation of these soft sunken areas, um, which can become highly visible. And in raspberries, we also see that the raspberry tissue almost starts to disintegrate and becomes very juicy with heavier infestations. One of the challenges in currently managing spotted wing drosophila is that these flies have a very rapid, generation, rapid life cycle. The entire process of egg to adult development only takes about 10 to 15 days, which means if you're not managing for spotted wing properly, it is possible for their populations to build up rapidly and result in a situation where you have multiple overlapping generations. Oh, 
sorry. In addition to spotted wing Drosophila, however, um, raspberries, which is one of their preferred host plants, also can suffer yield reductions from a suite of um, various fungal pathogens. In particular, here in Maryland, we see that these flies are overlapping temporally with several species of primary ra raspberry fungi, including Botrytis and Cladosporium fruit rot. <coughs> Botrytis, or gray mold, is a very widespread disease. It's known to infect over 200 species of plants worldwide, and in raspberries, is considered one of the most important pre- and post-harvest pathogens. Um, in general, as Botrytis infections progress, we see the growth of a gray fuzzy mycelium over the fruit surface, and eventually the raspberry fruit will start to desiccate and collapse in the later stages of infection. In general, botrytis infections and botrytis outbreaks seem to be favored by cool, wet conditions. So if we have summers like last year, for example, where we had a lot of rain, um, you're definitely at higher risk for having a serious botrytis problem. Um, and botrytis spores can be spread by both wind and rain. In general, um, researchers have identified two main mechanisms by which botrytis can infect raspberry fruits. It's possible for the spores to enter the fruit fr through the flowers. So if a spore does get into the flower, it will establish there as a latent infection, which means we won't see visible symptoms until the raspberry is fully ripened, at which point gray mold will develop. It's also possible for the botrytis to um, directly infect ripe fruit if spores are able to enter the fruit tissue through wounds caused from insects, birds, hail, or really any other source. Um, and again, if the botrytis does get into the fruit tissue, it will usually result in gray mold. Um, in addition to botrytis, cladosporium fruit rot caused by the cladosporium cladosporoides species complex is another pathogen that can infect raspberries pre-harvest. Um, generally with cladosporium fruit rots, we see the growth of this olive green mycelium over the fruit surface, though as the infection progresses to the later stage, um, it again can turn kind of a grayish, blackish color, which may make it easy to confuse with botrytis. Um, however, the difference with cladosporium is it doesn't tend to be as fuzzy in its growth patterns. Cladosporium infections can also be cryptic. In some instances, you'll have a raspberry that appears healthy from the outside, but then when you open it up, you'll see the growth of this cladosporium mycelium along the area where the receptacle would be. And so traditionally, cladosporium has really only been considered a minor post-harvest pathogen, so it's not something that's really scouted for or managed for. However, um, sampling by the Maryland Berry Pathology Lab in 2016 found um, varied rates of pre-harvest cladosporium incidence in raspberries, with the rates of infection ranging from 1 to 30%. And so this suggests that under certain conditions, um, it is possible that cladosporium could be a more important pathogen than we'd previously acknowledged. In general, cladosporium infections are associated with ripe or overripe fruit. Um, it is possible for these infections to develop if the, the fungi is able to get into the fruit for lesions, lesions on the surface. So for example, if you have a lesion from a botrytis infection or possibly wounds from insect or bird feeding again, um, it is possible to develop active cladosporium rot. And there's also been a number of studies that have suggested that cladosporium may be associated with um, insects. So it's possible that insects are playing a role in its um, spread. Sorry. And so, despite the fact that spotted wing Drosophila, and hopefully, hopefully as I've convinced you, both Botrytis and Cladosporium are independently um, major drivers in raspberry yield reduction, to the best of my knowledge, there's been relatively little work looking at the interactions between these two species of pests, um, and relatively little work looking at if they're influencing one another. And so, as part of my PhD dissertation, um, my research is really trying to fill this gap and start understanding first if there are interactions between spotted wing drosophila and fruit rots, and second, to start thinking about the potential implications for raspberry management. Um, so at this point, I've done two different studies to try and address these questions. Um, I started by surveying adult and larval fungal associations to see if spotted wing was actually interacting with the fungi under field conditions. And then I've also conducted laboratory studies looking at its potential for it to be a vector. So starting with these surveys, um, we surveyed larval fungal associations in 2015 using culture-based methods. In these surveys, we hand-collected spotted wing drosophila larvae from raspberries at various fruit farms, brought them back to our lab, 
and then surface sterilize the larvae by dipping them in ethanol. After that, we put the larvae on a sterile media plate and allowed it to crawl around for about half an hour, during which time it left behind a trail of frass. In that frass, um, we found yeast, but we also found several different fungal spores. And so we decided to go ahead and culture these fungi and then morphologically identify them to the genus level. In total, we identified five different genera of fungi from the larval frass, including both of our primary pathogens, Botrytis and Cladosporium. At the first field site where we conducted these surveys, 10 of the 14 larvae that we surveyed had Cladosporium in their frass, and at the second field site, three of the 12 larvae had Cladosporium in their frass. And we also had one larvae that had Botrytis in its frass. What this tells us is that under field conditions, spotted wing Drosophila larvae are encountering both Botrytis and Cladosporium, and the larvae are feeding on these fungi, um, which indicates that some sort of association exists. Um, I won't, I'm not showing this data today for the purposes of time, but we also conducted visual surveys where we went out to commercial farms and scouted fruit for the presence of both symptomatic Botrytis and Cladosporium infections and the presence of spotted wing Drosophila larvae. Um, and again, we found a similar rate, where there are low rates of larval fungal co-occurrence, indicating that spotted wing Drosophila larvae can develop in infected berries. Um, we've conducted adult surveys of adult fungal associations this past fall out here at the Y Research Center as well as at Keatesville. In these surveys, we hand collected adult flies and brought them back to our lab where we performed two sets of measurements. We first washed the fly in a sterile buffer solution, which essentially knocked off any fungal spores that they may have picked up on the outside of their body. And we then surface sterilized the, body, the fly and homogenized or smashed its whole body to get a sense of the internal microbial community. And in other words, those are gonna be the microbes that the flies are feeding on that have colonized their digestive tract. Both the spore wash and this gut homogenate were plated on PDA and incubated for about one week, at which point I went in and morph um, isolated and morphologically identified any fungi that emerged. In total, we isolated 150 strains of fungi from 34 flies, and we are still in the process of finishing up these identifications, but just to give you a sense of what we found so far, um, in total we have seven different genera of fungi, Many of these species are primary, uh, secondary post-harvest pathogens, but we did find that cladosporium occurred at the highest rate. 11 of the 34 flies that we surveyed were carrying cladosporium spores on the outside of their body, and four of those flies also had cladosporium in their guts, indicating again that they're feeding on these fungi. Um, so at this point, what this tells us is that spotted wing drosophila is probably associating with both botrytis and cladosporium. We have evidence that the larvae are feeding on both species, and we also see that the adults are possibly carrying cladosporium. That being said, there are many aspects of these interactions that remain unclear. Um, for example, we don't know if this is a purposeful interaction or um, one that's accidental. In other words, are the flies seeking out the fungi or do they just happen to come across it accidentally? And we also don't know how these interactions are impacting either pest or disease incidents. And so to get at the latter question, I've been conducting laboratory studies to assess the potential for spotted wing to vector these pathogens. Um, in these studies, I took laboratory flies and held them on a cladosporium or botrytis culture for about five hours. During that period of time, the flies were forced to interact with the fungi, either walking over it and picking up spores on their body or potentially feeding on it again. Um, after that five hour period, we removed all the flies from the fungi and transferred them to a sterile petri dish where they were held for varying periods of time, either 0, 24, 48, or 72 hours. Um, and by varying the period of time we held the flies before analyzing them, this allowed me to not only quantify the rate at which spotted wing is potentially picking up these fungal pathogens, but also look at how long they're potentially holding on to them once they get them. Um, at each of those time points, we analyzed four flies. Um, again, we quantified the fungi that were on that cuticle or the outside of their body using the spore wash. And then we also quantified the fungi that they'd been feeding on um, or through the gut smash. Um, both the spore wash and this gut smash homogenate were plated and again incubated, at which point I went into each plate and assessed it both for the presence or absence of fungi and also counted the number of colonies, providing me with a measure of the fungal density at each time point. 
Starting with the external accumulation, um, in total, we found very high rates of both fungal acquisition and persistence. 100% of the flies that we surveyed at all four time points, 0 through 72 hours post-exposure, did score positive for carrying both Botrytis and Cladosporium, indicating that once the flies pick up the fungi, they can hold on to it for a fairly prolonged period of time, which means there's a fairly large window in which they could be a potential vector. In terms of the density, for both of these graphs, the y-axis represents our fungal density as the number of colony-forming units per milliliter, and again, that's showed at each of our time points, 0 is 24, 48, and 72 hours post-exposure. Um, looking at the graph on the right for Botrytis, you can see right off the bat that in general, the density of Botrytis spores was significantly higher compared to the density of Cladosporium spores. But for both of these fungi, we see the same general trend where over time, the number of spores that they're carrying decreases. And this suggests that the flies are probably knocking the spores off their body or they're otherwise falling off. Um, anecdotally, we have seen that the flies try to groom fungal spores from their body as soon as they're exposed. Um, this video was taken about one minute after I put the flies on a fungal culture. And if you look closely, you can see that he's actually rubbing his legs over his head. And then later on, after the video, he started rubbing his legs over the wing and the abdomen as well. And again, we think this is a behavior that's designed to knock off the spores. Um, though, as the results from these stu studies suggest, it's not entirely successful. Um, finally, looking at accumulation within the digestive tract, um, we did see some differences in how they responded to Botrytis and Cladosporium. Um, overall, there were differences in the incidence, um, which are represented by these numbers above the bars. For Cladosporium, at the zero hour time point, so immediately after the flies were removed from the fungi, 100% of them were indeed carrying Cladosporium inside their gut, indicating that they all fed on it. But over time, that number did decrease slightly, so by 72 hours post-exposure, only 81% of the flies surveyed still had Cladosporium in their gut. And so this probably reflects the fact that once they feed on the fungi, the spores are passing through their digestive tract or somehow getting broken down by the midgut. Um, with Botrytis, we found much lower incidences in general. Um, zero hours post-exposure, only 80% of the flies had the Botrytis in their gut. And from 24 to 72 hours, that number then dropped to 10 to 20%. Um, similarly, when you look at the fungal density um, as the colony forming units per milliliter, we can see overall that there's significantly higher density of cladosporium compared to Botrytis. So to wrap this up, um, at this point what these laboratory have studies have demonstrated is that adult spotted wing drosophila are at least capable of vectoring Botrytis and cladosporium in the lab. And based on the results of these studies, there may be some difference in the mechanism by which they're interacting with the different species. Um, that being said, you know, we still have a long way to go. Um, this this, these studies do not tell us how, um, how this is going to work under field conditions. So we don't know if these vectoring studies are going to hold up in the field. But that is something I'm hoping to tease apart with future work. Um, and so finally, getting back to the so what um, and why it's really important to be understanding these interactions, I would argue that this um, work does, um, understanding these interactions suggests that it could be, have important implications for pest and pathogen management. Um, and to highlight this, I'm gonna, I wanted to describe another study briefly that was conducted in New York. In this study, um, researchers demonstrated that drosophilid fruit flies are capable of vectoring um, the bacteria responsible for grape sour rot disease. And when they conducted small plot trials, they found that if they sprayed the grapes with both an uh, antimicrobial agent and an insecticide that targeted drosophilid fruit flies, they found significantly reduced disease incidence compared to if they sprayed the grapes with antimicrobials alone, suggesting that in some cases you can improve overall fruit quality by integrating insect and pathogen management. And it's possible that a similar scenario could emerge for raspberries, where by integrating management of spotted wing drosophila and Botrytis or Cladosporium, we could again greatly improve fruit quality, um, though these are all questions that are TBA. Um, and so with that, I was going to wrap up. I just wanted to let you know that our lab does have a website, hambylab.weebly.com, that contains contact information for myself as well as my advisor, Kelly Hamby, um, information about current research in our lab, news articles, and fact sheets. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any more questions if there's time. <laughs>